new slides that we uh, we put in that will address a couple other issues. But uh, as it goes, it's just knowing the game and hoping that we don't have to play it every year. Uh, we've been very fortunate these last couple of years. Uh, this year's a little different story. The way it's setting up, we don't know what's going to happen, and we are at the uh, mercy of the weather. So uh, we'll explain that as we get through the slides a little bit. But on a lighter note, on a very happy note, we have another new member of our CERT team. Uh, this young lady took it upon herself to go take the course down at the county, Public Safety Academy. She does work in town. She lives in town. And I'd like to call Mandy Vendersen up, please, to accept this. Mary, you want to come on up? Deb, you want to come up? And um, I'll present it to the mayor. The mayor can present it to Deb, and Deb can present wow. it to you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> how, how about we do that? Uh, you can read it. Go ahead. All right. Uh, what it says, and we encourage everybody to join our team, or at least to take the training. So even if you don't want to be an active participant on the team, we, we get that. Maybe you don't have the time. Maybe you just don't have the gumption to do that. But we'd certainly like you to be self-prepared so that you can help yourself in your own home and perhaps your own family and your own neighborhood. And this certificate reads Community Emergency Response Team, which is a proud part of the USA Freedom Corps. The President's Call to Service, Mandy Vendorsen, has successfully completed the Community Emergency Response Team training to become a member of the President's Citizen Corps dated March 9th, 2019, sponsored by the State County OEM. Mandy? Thank you very much. Thank you. And maybe he does want to be part of our team. So that's great because we always, to new team members, we are above 60 right now. Right now. And we've trained over about over 130 people in our community, which is terrific. Because this program is really about neighbors helping neighbors and obviously knowing what to do yourself. If you did not get a booklet or a refrigerator magnet when you came in, please get one before you leave. Every disaster that you can imagine is covered in here. I hate to say it that way, but there's really no way to say it. But every disaster or emergency that you can conceive of is in this booklet, and it's just a list of do's, don't, uh, do's and don'ts on how to prepare yourself and your family for disaster. So please make sure you get one of these before you leave. We're going to try to move right along because this, uh, it, while it's not a lengthy program, you know, I add a little bit to it, to each slide, just to bring it to life. And um, we certainly want to get through this and educate you, so hopefully you'll go home and have an impact on your family and your neighbors and encourage them uh, to come out and, and participate and at least read the materials and become self-educated. I know everybody can't be here tonight. We publicized it as much as we can. Do we put out the phone call this afternoon? Everybody got the phone call. If you did not, if you did not get that phone call, make sure that you sign up. I'll tell you how to do that. All right, and um, myself, Al Evangelista, I'm up here. Our deputy coordinator, Bill Bake, is also councilman. Most of you know Bill. Mayor Sarah is here this evening. I saw Council President Riker came into the room. Welcome and thank you for being here. Anybody else that I missed on the council? We got everybody, right? All right, today's presentation is all about creating a disaster-ready community, which we have. All right, we have strived to achieve certain goals, and we now have a storm-ready community uh, designation by the National Weather Service. As a matter of fact, just this past uh, fall, we had to resubmit a new application because it expires every three, I think it's three years, and uh, we are now accredited to 2020. And we got our certificate just recently. We posted it it's in the, uh, the borough offices. We're very proud of that because not all communities can be storm ready. Very, very few in New Jersey are storm ready. And we have to have that designation through the hard work of, of our different groups and uh, obviously uh, the different teams that we have in town, emergency services. So it, it's a beautiful thing. They will be coming out to visit Pompton Lakes later this spring. We're gonna go up there and take a road trip to up to New York. It'll be open to uh, our various teams here as well. Uh, to visit the National Weather Service, which is responsible for our area, and that's up to New York. <coughs> All right, we have that storm ready awareness. Um, we'll go through what that means a little bit. Emergency preparedness, again, is what it's all about. We see it all the time, and no matter how much we preach, and how much we coach, and how much we uh, educate, 
and urge people to be prepared. They're never prepared. They're never prepared. When the storm hits or there's an impending, you know, disaster coming around the corner, everybody then starts to scramble to try to do things and catch up and do what they should have done all along the way, and that's when it gets to be a little chaotic. So tonight's presentation is all about keeping everybody on an even keel so that we're always ready. We should be always ready for emergencies, not just when we hear that they may be coming. And family planning is so important. It's so important you go back and you educate your kids. I know in the summer I speak to the summer camp, I speak to the junior police academy, I speak to the senior citizens group about the exact things we're talking about right here. How to prepare themselves in the event of an emergency. Because it's all of us together. If everybody else can pitch in and do their little part, then our emergency services don't have to do it all. Because remember, in an event, our emergency services are part of that. All right, they're compromised as well. About half of our fire department lives in the flood area as well. So we lose that manpower, if you will. So it's important that everybody knows how to help themselves when, uh, when they need big. All right, elected officials, I want to mention the fact to you, and you may know, know this already, but they are extremely supportive to us in the area of emergency preparedness and emergency response. Okay, I want to say we have some of the best equipment out there between police, fire, first aid, uh, CERT, DPW, and our MUA, who also jumps in and helps us. They're a partner with us, and they are always there when we need their help. So thank you to the Mayor and Council for providing us the funding that we need and the wherewithal to do what we need to do on a daily basis. Uh, Sharon Sonny is here. Many of you know her already, either through Girl Scouts or the Records Bureau or a couple other things she belongs to. I lost track of it, but what I do want to say about Sharon is she is the Secretary for OAM. She does a terrific job in keeping those things in line that we have to do on a, a daily basis as well. So I'm glad she could be here this evening. RACES, which is the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Services, right here in the Records Room. We have ham radios, and we have ham radio operators in this room right now. I see a couple that are here. And remember that in most disasters worldwide, and I'm talking not maybe not countries as, as well equipped or well off as ours is, but a lot of the countries, the bottom line is races, ham radio communications. Because you can have all the stuff on you want, and when those towers are down, nobody's talking. It's that simple. It just happened recently. But they just happened in New York State, as a matter of fact, recently, and in the Eastern Seaboard where they lost texting service a couple of weeks ago. So it's, it's a fragile infrastructure, okay? You never know what can happen with it. So we still maintain races because in a, in a, a big disaster, um, they come through for us. All right, the borough phone numbers, if you're calling up for an emergency management purpose, it's the regular borough numbers, extension 707, during a declared emergency. So when the governor declares an emergency, we always declare as well. Not so much for snowstorms, but I'm talking bigger events, storms, uh, perhaps hurricanes, things of that nature. Um, we could have to declare our own local emergency. Uh, if you remember a couple of years ago, we lost all our water in Ponta Lakes because of a major water main break. And we had to declare a local emergency. So we will put that out via the phone numbers and uh, get it out to the community as quickly as possible. So we have a multitude of ways to communicate with our partners, whether they be the county, state police, state partners, or even federal for that matter. So we are well equipped in that area as well. The four phases, you've heard me say this before. If you've heard me speak before, there are four phases of emergency management. Mitigation is the most important. And up until a couple of years ago, it was the least uh, recognized because we didn't have a good crew of people that took it seriously, brought the concerns to the mayor and council, and then, then we can act on it, like river be snagging, be silting, uh, tree removals down in the rivers and things like that. So I commend and have commended our flood advisory board for the work that they do. They meet on the fourth Thursday of each month. It's on your borough calendar. All right, open to the public, the meetings. You can come and listen to their, uh, you know, their agenda and the things that they do for the borough. But mitigation is now strong in Ponte Lakes, and it's proven itself. Because in the last couple of years, our rain events, some of them significant, or some of them at the time when the rivers were up and the reservoirs were up, we really got through without an issue. And that's kudos to them, kudos to everybody involved. Preparedness is the second one. We're always prepared. Our emergency services, that is, are always prepared. We have to be on a daily basis. There's no doubt about that. Are we prepared? 
Are we prepared? When we know there's an impending storm, are we ready to go? Do we have the provisions? We're going to talk about that. Recovery after it's all over. And you just saw it in Nebraska. It's been on all the channels the last couple of, uh, the last couple of months. Recovery is the toughest part because you're dealing with emotions. You're dealing with psyche, you know, people's psyche and how they're handling and coping with that disaster. Counselors have to be brought in, which we did for Irene. We brought in counselors. They met with the residents down in our, uh, our flood-affected areas, and they provided that, um, you know, the very needed communication with them to, you know, raise their spirits, keep them going, and making sure they got to the appropriate authorities to get the, uh, you know, the support that they needed through FEMA and or insurance companies or whatever. Uh, mitigation activities, there they are. Uh, we do that every year, grant applications, money for all of the things that we need to do. Uh, it even goes so far under storm water management, the clearing of the storm drains and the grace. Uh, you should know and have asked. As a matter of fact, I got a comment on Facebook one day where the, the gentleman said, why are we uh, being asked to clean our, clean our storm drain grates? Isn't that the DPW's job? Yes, it is. But when you know there's an impending storm and the drains are clogged with leaves, I even go out and do mine. I take a rake and I rake the leaves up, pick them up, get them out of the way so they don't clog the storm drains. The quicker we can get the water to recede and the drain, the better off we're going to be. Advising the public to back down the hatches, I use this example all the time. Your neighbor's got all this lawn furniture out. We're expecting high winds. Just a couple weeks ago, again, 60 mile an hour wind gusts on that one weekend. We had high wind warnings, 40, 50 miles an hour, wind gusts of 60, and there were people who had their garbage out. Right. I wonder why they, they couldn't find their cans the next day. So, you know, it's things like that you got to think about, and sometimes you just got to react to it without being told what to do. It's common sense. Elevation and removal of severe repetitive lost homes. You know what's going on in the south end of our town. If you've driven through that, River Drive is almost uh, one of the houses and homes along that that waterway right there, which is a benefit to everybody in our town. It's a benefit to our first responders. I had to go in and rescue those people. Uh, people who are out of harm's way. A lot of good elevations going up down there. Okay, a lot of them are looking uh, very nice, and it's kind of looking like the shore in certain sections. You get down to shore, you see they're all elevated. The homes are all elevated on stilts and or, uh, you know, basements. So elevation is what we'd like to see. But in some cases, that homes have to be removed, removed because of their se severe repetitive losses. Uh, community, community notifications, we have many different ways. Storm Ready looks at this. And we get a lot of credit toward our CRS, which is community rating system. We get a lot of credits for being a member of Storm Ready. And we have to have all of these things in place, which we do. Our phone notification system, um, email, text, Twitter, Facebook, we use. And if you don't use it, it's not going to help you. But uh, even on Channel 77 now, we have the ability to post on the bottom of the screen. And I have done it a couple times uh, during storm events. And I will continue to do that. So on the bottom, you'll get that scroll that you see you know, on, on some of your news stations. We have sign boards out. Uh, we have warning signs. School notification. They have their own notification systems, which we like. We work very closely with Dr. Raymond Rosa in the school district so that we needed them to put out emergency messages, they could do it as well and help us out. We have sirens, uh, which we are uh, mandated to have, you know, under our CRS program, we have to have the sirens. We have six fire sirens. You hear them blow when there's a fire, but during a storm event, we don't blow them. We shut them off and we use them only for, for storm notifications. So uh, we do have that in place. And the vehicle sound system is a good old walking around knocking on doors or loudspeakers through the, through the community. All right, our communications are all redundant. They're all backed up, and they're all separate from other vendors. So, God forbid, a vendor that supplies us with service goes down. This system goes down. It's not going to impact our police, fire, and AMS communications. We're completely separate. 911 PSAP right here. We answer for three towns, ours included, of course. And we always bring in a second dispatcher during a period of, you know, high call volume to assist the, uh, the patrols and the people out of the field that are helping you out. Always have spare batteries in your house. Make sure you have all the different sizes. You never know what you need until you need it. And uh, if the stores are closed, they're not going to help you out. So try to uh, be prepared in that vein. As far as um, 
Our community is concerned. The borough itself, local emergency planning committee meetings, we have to have two year by law. Sometimes we have more, depending on a storm. Uh, our emergency plans are exercised. We just got credit for the six inch gas main that was uh, damaged in the quarry, going back about two months ago. If any of you were privy to that, we got called over there, they were scraping the ground with a, 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 a huge loader and they knocked the valve off and broke it. So we responded, police, fire, hazmat, EMS, and we can get credit for that under our plan. So uh, we do submit for those things. Our start team is always ready. They have shelter supplies and materials such as cots, bedding, food, for bags and other incidentals. When uh, we have an impending storm, Deborah calls me up, our circuit coordinator. She said, what do you think? And I say, yeah, it might look like, you know, we have to set up the shelter, which is right across the street at Corner Mall Center, and she'll get the wheels in motion. And I said, and I've got to come in. Our CERT team, very active team. They, they just come right out and they, they start giving the roll. So uh, thank you on behalf of all the residents for your service. I don't know what we did before 2006 when we formed that CERT team. I really don't know what we did because we used to use Lakeside School as a shelter. And it used to be run by Mr. Moore, Dave Moore, and his wife. And now those two people operated that shelter. Um, I, I give them kudos for that, but uh, it's much more on point now and much more organized with the uh, CERT team. And everybody that's in emergency service are put on standby. The police are already on 12 hour shifts, and we have standby for the first aid squad and fire department as well. So everybody uh, is prepared to go. We top off. Everything with fuel, food supplies uh, are ready for our responders. Don't forget, we got to feed them because the stores are closed, and um, they may be sleeping in on their at their stations. And the emergency operating center, which is right here in the records room, is staffed and activated as necessary. We have people in here answering the phones. Certain members have done that in the past and do it very well. So uh, we're prepared here. I tell you out in that respect. All right, we have this annual awareness seminar. I talked about these already, the things that I speak out. Park today, we're there with the truck. We set up the command post and pass out literature. The holiday stroll, national night out. So we're doing a lot of community public information, trying to get the word out for people to become educated, help yourselves. And I know that a lot of people in this room are already there. So uh, hopefully people are going to be watching this on Channel 77. They'll get the message and start to prepare themselves and their families. I just want to make a comment before I forget on the Civic Ready telephone notification system. I had a young lady, and I've told a story every year. A young lady approached me, uh, I think it was a long today, and she came up and asked me, can I sign up for your, your notification system for your telephone? I said, yes. I said, do you look that? She said, no. That's exactly why I want to sign up. She says, I have two elderly parents that live in Ponte Lake. She says, I'll get down the shore. But I would love to know when you put an emergency message out that there's an issue, because I will get in my car and start driving up to my parents' house. I said, excellent idea. I hadn't even thought about that. All right, as a viable alternative to get help for those people. But if you have relatives and they want to be on this system, it's very easy to can sign up. The call is not just for Ponte Lake. So if you have family members that might need help, put them on the system and they'll get the messages when there's an issue, and they can start to make their way here to help out those family members in need. Are right, you going to have access to NOAA website for river levels and storm and flood predictions at waterweather.gov. It's on our homepage for our, um, you're going to see it in a couple of minutes, on our homepage for our, for our website. So you personally can check the river gauges. Um, I don't know how many people monitor NOAA weather radio. If you listen to it, it'll drive you nuts because it's just a, it's just a message that keeps going around and around and around. But it's good. You know, it's good and it's accurate. And um, we have those radios in all the schools in the borough buildings, by the way, NOAA weather radios. Every school was given a NOAA weather radio a couple of years by OEM. And I make sure every year we go around and make sure they're in place, they're plugged in. And it's part of our sort of community um, requirement as well. And what that radio is, it's silent until there's a signal they send out. And that signal activates the radio, and then that message comes over that you don't want to hear over and over and over again. All right, so uh, they're great little radios. They sell them everywhere. You can buy them online if you want to get your own. But, um, you know, we're also getting those cell phone alerts now, 
right? We had the uh, national cell phone right, some months ago, the national test. And uh, hopefully we never, never need that one. All right, I already mentioned we're covered by Upton. Our website has a plethora of information pertaining to any type of storm or disaster event. So if you go to our website, go under government, you'll see emergency management, click on it, and you want to peruse that site. And I would suggest you do the same thing for the Flood Advisory Board. Go on the community, Flood Advisory Board, and read everything you want to know there about what they're doing to mitigate, what they're doing to educate, and what they're doing to make sure that our borough, those, those lands that should be there to uh, restore the water table and so forth like that are, are there in their natural state, which as we know uh, wasn't always the case. All right, there's information what to do before, during, and after storm. Again, don't wait till that storm is in and go on your computer and try to find out what to do because if the power goes out, you're done. If you don't have a generator, you know, you're pretty much done. So uh, this little booklet I passed out, I bought them, I don't know how many years ago, because they're, they're replete with information that you really want to know. So take the time to read them. Uh, make sure your kids are educated. All right? If you have young kids home or you're... Your kids have kids. Make sure those kids know what to do if there's a disaster, if something happens while they're out and about. Okay, if they're in school, we know the schools are trained. They have plans in place that have to be approved by the state, OEM, and all that stuff is covered. It's when those kids maybe at a friend's house, maybe they're not under direct adult supervision, something happens, they have to know what to do. Okay, but most importantly, and it says it in here somewhere else, keep them away from floodwaters, kids, always. That's why I always encourage the superintendent to have school on days when we have flood issues because you want those kids confined. You want them in school. We want them off the streets. We don't want them playing in the rivers. And again, no power equals no internet. And I think we're all aware of that. We just had another power outage today in one queue. Okay, it was like 1,500 or 1,200 people without. So we're getting a lot of power outages lately. In Pompton Lakes, we're good. Uh, we, we're good. Our power outage is caused by the out-of-town substations that are going down or the feeder lines going into our borough. A couple of weeks ago, we had the south end down. We had no control over that. If a tree comes down, we're going to think a, a huge line out, 64,000 old line. We're dead in the water. There's nothing we can do about it. We're fed by three different substations here. So, yes, while the south end may be out, I have power. North end has power. If it comes out of one acute, I'm fed out of one acute where I live. If that station goes down, I won't have power in vice versa. So don't always think the whole town's got to go dark if we're without power. It's not going to happen that way. Right? It is sectioned off. Uh, we have some streets where it just blows a few. It's not like road. There's so many trees and it's such a narrow street. We get a tree down on water there, and all those ones are without power from that line. And really, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, the, the important thing is always call in to report your own outage because it populates their database. Okay? Don't call the police because it's not gonna, they're not going to help you. They've already made the call that we have a power outage. When you call, they populate that. They put your, your address on a computer screen and it shows them where the heaviest outage is and that's what they will respond to first. So it behooves you to report it by phone on your own and then you'll be set to go. Our approved borough shelter, I already mentioned, the Corner Health Center. Uh, we have a written agreement with them, and CERT runs that and does an exceptional job. Our secondary shelter is Lakeside School because it has a generator. And our third shelter we needed is St. Mary's Church Hall. Our colleague Moyle is our school and shelter liaison with, you know, from the school. She attends all our LPC meetings. And uh, up to the point where we had the Corner Health Center, we have used Lakeside School primarily, but again, on a school day, it presents a problem. Because the kids are in the school, we need half the gym, physical ed classes are compromised and so forth. No pets at shelters, we can't accept them. So again, if you know a storm is coming, you know a hurricane is coming, get your pets somewhere. Relative, friend, um, you know, just get them out of the, uh, the affected area because we don't want to have to deal with that. And Dr. Katini at the Pontin Animal Hospital will accept pets for free. And house them there, but he's limited in what you know how many animals he can take as well. So get there early and, and hope for a spot. And make sure you have all your supplies that you need. Um, I can't tell you how many people come to the shelters and they forgot their glasses, they forgot their prescriptions, they forgot this. 
You forgot that. You've got to bring it with you. Have a go kit. We encourage people to have a go kit. Have some money in case the ATMs are out. Uh, you know, bring your prescriptions, glasses, and whatever else. Toys for kids. They always like their own toys, and it, it gives them special comfort. All right, shelter requirements. We must have police here, EMS. This is stuff that many of you may, may already know. I want to mention that third one, Board of Health Compliant, or with food. And I, I just saw it on Facebook this week or last week. We cannot, in a shelter, allow people bringing homemade food. It's against Board of Health regulations. Okay? So even if you had an event in a public place with a public somebody, you cannot have homemade food. It's got to be made in a commercial kitchen. Okay? And the kitchen's got to be inspected by the Board of Health. Uh, I don't think this is something new. I think it's been around a long time. Um, I think there's been incidents, not in our town necessarily, that caused them now to, you know, double down on it a little bit. But just know that if you're doing a nice thing and baking a cake and bringing it to shelter, we can't really use that. We can't bring anything out that's homemade. It's got to be packaged, you know, we're meeting a facility that's designed to do that. So uh, please don't take it the wrong way, because these particular people did, and they're like, well, they don't want me to help. But it, it's not about that. It's about the uh, laws in that regard. All right, we do have a secure shelter. We don't let people roam around. We have police there. We turn over the medications. We take them. We have a lockbox. We put the medications in so nobody's got them in a room where somebody can steal them, take them, or uh, lose them. All right, flood plane manager. We get these uh, questions once in a while. Our floodplain manager for Ponte Lakes is our construction official, South Poli. His office is right down the end of the hall when you go out here. If you have any questions, you may go down here or go to the flood advisory board meeting. Uh, many times they have all the answers to your question right here. Laura Bennett is here. She's a chairwoman. She's sitting in the rear over there by that lovely picture. Taking care of keeping those kids under control. <laughs> and a husband who just walked in. Um, but you may go to those meetings or you may go see Sal and, uh, you know, get answers to questions you may have. It's available to assist residents of floodplain delineation and information, the maps. There's maps out there and things that you may not understand that they can help you with. Police Department, you know, you know what they do. I'm not going to uh, belabor that one. Just realize that in an emergency, calls are stacked. And what that means is they get priority. So obviously a heart attack, you know, chest pains or something like that is going to move up to the top of the list. You know, and if you have an issue with a tree down in your yard and it hasn't fallen through your roof, it's going to stay there. And that call may move down a little bit. So if that happens, you've got to be patient. They'll get there. If it's just a report, let them know that. If it's just for reporting reasons, because they don't have to be there right away. But obviously if it deals with public safety and health, we want to be there right away. We have a five-ton high-water vehicle. We have a boat, a couple boats, Ray Boyd Brothers. Hopefully, we never have to use them again. All right, that would just make us happy, except to go out on the lake, uh, which is quite nice these days. All right, fire department, always on the ball, always ready to respond. Uh, last year, we had, I think, 321 calls, uh, which is busy for our little town of 11,500 people. So... Uh, they're always ready to respond, but as I said, many of them are compromised as well by the plane and um, cannot get out as they'd like to, to help out. So uh, we like people to help themselves when they can. Our first aid squad, same thing, ready to go. They stay in house. Duty squads are ready to respond at all times. Uh, we do have the squad building set up where we can house people there uh, for emergency purposes, like a temporary hospital. Uh, we do have some other you know, vehicles that uh, they can use to respond as well, just to bolster their, uh, their response. As far as recovery, it's so important to recovery. The biggest issue I can, I can remind you of is to take pictures. During the recovery phase, take pictures of everything. It's the first thing the insurance company is going to ask you for, pictures, pictures, pictures. And take it where it lies. Don't move it all, you know, out to the curb and then take the picture, because that could be in front of anybody's house. So if the debris is in your house, behind your house, on the side of your house, in your house, take those pictures. You can take another picture outside, that's up to you, but make sure the photos and videos are taken. A video is really good because it, it shows the whole picture, and you could also narrate it while you're doing it, and that, that works well as well. Uh, if the building is severely damaged, 
our construction crews are going to tag it. You're going to, you know, be looking for other accommodations. And uh, we do have the American Red Cross that comes out and helps in that regard for a temporary housing. Obviously, you would need something more long term. Our borough resources do what we call public infrastructure assessment. We're looking for things like damaged roads, damaged bridges, which you saw and see in all these new channels where they show the road have to watch out, or maybe the bridge let go. Uh, those are the things that we do from a public perspective because FEMA, they uh, compensate both private and public for infrastructure. So we've got to make that uh, delineation. DPW is always out there. They're responsible for that windshield survey, driving around, saying this is damaged, that's damaged, making a list that we can report. Because during the storm, we have, to, we have to report every so many hours during the storm. So they can track this and see the scope of the damage that's being done by this particular event. So while it's dangerous, it's got to be done. Um, we have their borough owned equipment, you know, at our leisure. And the, their biggest task, obviously, is always debris removal. It's a monumental task. For those of you that went through it, in Irene, down in South End, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we were there for weeks and months trying to get rid of the brick. And it's expensive and it's, it becomes a health issue as well. Philcon is always available for us. NGO stands for non-governmental organization. They're not part of government, but they're there to help us. And um, they always provided needed support to our borough and still continue to do so. So we thank them as well. It's a great resource. And we have a couple of local contractors that do the same thing. And uh, they will come out with their equipment and assist us as necessary, which we appreciate. Our health department, you know what they do? They go out to shelter, right? They go to all the restaurants, make sure everything's up to snuff, make sure there's no food contamination, water contamination, things of that nature. And uh, they will respond. We have an interlocal agreement with Wayne. They will respond with people adequate enough to get out into the field and, and do these inspections quickly and get on top of the situation. The other way, can't say enough about them. As I said, their, uh, their equipment that they have available, that we have used in the past, is always available and uh, they're always there to assist. They check continually the pot of water during the storm, make sure it's not contaminated, make sure there's no breach in the, in the piping systems, and knock on wood, over all the years that we have had events down here, we have not had a compromise for our system, which speaks to their, uh, their advantage as well. So, um, you know, they do a good job, and they, they, get, they get damaged as well because they're in harm's way where they're located, as we all know. <coughs> Flood zone security, it's a police function. They're on top of it. Flood watch, you know what that means. Flood watch is we're watching out for a potential flood. You should begin to prepare. You should begin to get things together. Uh, you know, raise things in your home. Don't wait until that last minute. It gets overwhelming. You're not going to be able to do it. Uh, the Passaic Valley River Basin, three rivers. As you know, you may know. You've heard me say before. Uh, we lie between the Aquanic and Ramapo. Quantic being on the Riverdale side, Ramapo being on the Wayne side, and then we have the Wanaku River that runs straight through the center of our town down to the Vanessa Bridge, which is on Riverdale Road, um, and it uh, then dumps into the Quantic River at that point. All of the rivers are in great shape, and what I mean by that is the Flood Advisory Board has done inspections of those rivers. Uh, we've used drones to inspect those rivers, just the latest uh, this past Sunday. We did an inspection of the Wanaki River, and through Lauren's uh, generosity of her employer, we're going to be doing it in the River. And uh, they map every obstruction on that river, and then we can go back in without putting people in harm's way to do the inspection. We can go back in and remediate that problem. So it's, it's a great thing to have. We have a licensed pilot who operates our drone for OEM. It's a special police officer in town here, which makes it even better. So uh, we have used that to our advantage, and we will continue to do so and keep our rivers clean. What we found in the old adage, you can keep the gutters clean, the water's going to flow, and you won't have a roof leak. And the same thing is similar here. Okay, we keep those rivers clean, we keep the water moving, and keep it in the banks. And uh, we've been successful with that, with the events that we've had so far. Of course, we haven't had uh, anything near uh, Irene, but hopefully we don't. 
going forward. But the possibility is always there. Flooding, uh, high water levels can occur at any, any time of the year. Unfortunately, we're right to occur during the spring, and we are right, right now for an event. And what I mean by that is the reservoirs are full, the rivers are up because of what comes downstream from up north New York State and so forth. And um, I just want everybody to be, be aware of, of that. Um, while we haven't had a big rain event, nothing says that we could get a storm that produces four or six inches of rain in a very short time period, and that's enough to put our rivers open back when they're in this particular situation. So just keep that in mind, and we will keep an eye on it. We always do. And um, we'll notify the community accordingly. We obviously want you to be aware of it so that you can check it yourself. And you can do so on the uh, website, which you'll see here in a minute, right there. Right under government, if you go to, uh, again, our website, mountainlakes-nj.gov, go under government, and you'll see emergency management, and the four river gauges are right there. Click on any one of them, and we'll bring up that particular uh, gauge, that graph. Uh, under uh, flood advisory board, same thing, under community. They're under community. Just scroll down, and you'll see uh, the flood advisory board and river gauges there. Same four river gauges, just a different spot to access them. And uh, that river gauge will tell you an action stage, which just means get ready, you know, keep an eye out, open your eyes, open your ears, maybe begin to prepare, and then we have minor flooding, moderate flooding, and major flooding. Those three categories on top of that. So uh, the gauges have proven to be pretty accurate. Uh, they show the crest of the storm, which is usually about 12 hours after the rain stops. And um, it's been a big, big advantage to, to our emergency management operation because we never had this type of uh, technology before. So it's a beautiful thing. All right, we talked about flood watch. Flood warning, when that comes out, and we have a warning posted, it means that we're, we could be in trouble. Let's put it that way. And what, what I want to do is differentiate between a flash flood and a flooding event. Flash flood is when it rains so hard, okay, that it collects in our rivers, and the rivers swell very quickly and come over the banks. Uh, we just saw evidence of a flash flood in Little Falls. If you saw that video that was on the news with the cars going under the bridge, that was a flash flood. Okay, a lot of water collected in a very small river or space, or actually creek if you want to go that far. And uh, it swelled very quickly, and it only takes about two feet of water to float a vehicle, which is what happened. So you never want to drive through it for that reason either. And two feet of water to float a car. So when you see the warnings posted, you should have already been preparing. You should be ready to evacuate if necessary. And remember, don't rely on electronic devices if the power is out or your phone service goes out, you're not going to have that as, a, uh, as an advantage. We will always do door-to-door -door notification. We've always done it. Either serve EPA or police department will knock on doors because we don't know that you didn't get the message through the telephone. So we do go house to house when we know that that particular street may be underwater. And we do uh, make sure that we, we touch on every house, even if we don't get an answer. So that's a flood warning. Not to be misconstrued with a flash flood warning. Now, the uh, National Weather Service puts out a lot of flash flood warnings. Every time there's a, a rain event, you'll see some type of flash flood, flash flood warning, depending on the river that's affected. Our particular rivers, well, they're not major rivers, they're, they're not creeks either, and um, they can tolerate a considerable amount of water uh, without the uh, possibility of a flash flood. Okay, so. Uh, just know those two uh, two differences there, because a lot of people hear flash flood warning and they, you know, they think that um, the whole south end is going to go into the flood. That's not always the case. We beat this up. You know about that. If you have to sign up on the website, right there, pontonlakes-nj.gov. On the left hand side, in the column, it says sign up for emergency notifications. Emergency notification, a little triangle. That's the one you want to sign up for. 
The other notification button will give you things like meetings, council meetings, other meetings, or any other you know, notifications. But the one for emergencies in the left-hand column, click on that, and you can sign up everybody. Put your kids in there. You can put all your kids in there. So God forbid they're out and about, and there's a, a warning, something happened that's imminent, uh, like that gas main break. They'll hear that, and they'll go in the other direction. And right, if you're not computer literate, we do have the sign-up forms in Borough Hall, police headquarters, and the library. Just fill them out, send them to Sharon in the Records Bureau. The police department shall get them, she'll enter the information for you. If you're getting redundant calls, some people are getting three and four calls because they have signed up three or four times for the same phone number. Sharon went in, found that problem, deleted all the other redundant phone numbers. A lot of people, when they click it, you know, they don't know if it really wants to click it again, and maybe a third time, I do three times. So, that happens. I do that, too. But I want to keep reservoir as we sit here on Wednesday night. As of Monday, it was 100.9%, so it is full, and it's filling. And uh, the Charlottesville Reservoir is in, I don't know the exact level, Joe, you know Charlottesville? It's got to be close to full. Okay, it's got to be close to full, if not full as well. And um, as I said, we had um, 80 inches of rain. Am I correct? Last year, 80 inches of rain. Uh, Joe sits on our flood advisory board. He's our climatologist. And he does all his water, water works. <laughs> and uh, he had great news for us in December that we had eight inches of, 80 inches of rain in Ponte Marks last year. That's a lot of water. That is a lot of water. It was the highest on record since record keeping was, was kept. All right, the highest, 2018, not just in Pumpkin Lakes, was the highest year total for rainfall in history since records were kept. So um, the reservoirs are up, the rivers are a little bit swollen, they're starting to go down, but they are moving, they look good. There is no floodgates on the Wallachie Reservoir, it's a fixed spillway. Floodgates are down here, unfortunately, on the dam, but um, the rivers and reservoir are usually up in the spring, and presently they are. Out of Barrow and downstream communities are notified of gate openings by the DEP. They call the mayor, call me, sometimes they call him, he calls me. But we get a notification that the gates are opening. You get the notification by here on the siren. The same thing. The siren is there to notify anybody downstream that the gates are opening and there's going to be a flash flood kind of event where the water is going to rise. Uh, just so you know the purpose behind that, I want to say about 10 years ago in Bloomingdale, out of the Quantic River, there were two fishermen fishing on an island right up there by uh, that one bar stumble on in, there in the river, and there was a flash, there was a dam release, and there was kind of a flash flood event, and they got stranded on the island. We, we had to go rescue them with, uh, with uh, an area ladder to get them off the island. So, you over the, I get a lot of calls about the sirens. So just talk yes. about that a little bit. That siren that's on that gate, on that dam, only operates when the gate, when the gate opens and it's there to tell people downstream that might be in the vicinity of the river. Not the people who live a half mile or a mile away. That's really not the purpose of it. It's to, to, the purpose of it is downstream fishermen. We've got a lot of fishermen right there in that area. It just alerts them that the dam is opening and they're going to just swallow water down there. Now, I know... Pretty much everybody can hear it. I hear it at my house. Um, it's not really something we get super excited about because that dam could open and relieve water, but we're not going to flood. And it's happened a number of times over the last uh, six months, maybe even a year, where that's the, the gates have opened to relieve water from the lake. <coughs> the lake level is monitored, so when it rises, the gate opens to let it dump and bring it back to that level. So you may hear that. It's nothing to get super excited about. What I would suggest you do is go to that website, Mount the Lakes, and look at that river level gauge, and you'll see uh, actually where it is. Those gates are backed up by an emergency generator. All of those cameras are viewed by, uh, by the Wanaki Reservoir Police up there, and our town does not control the gates. I can't tell you how many people say to me all the time, who controls the gates in our town? Nobody. We have nothing to do with the gates. So, a computer program designed by Army Corps Engineers, DEP, 
and it's out of our hands. We have input. We have that input at meetings. But they have uh, assured us that they have looked at the programs and the data and that they were in the parameters that they need to be to make that dam, to make those dam gates operate efficiently and as designed. Let's put it that way. All right, water mitigation efforts, I've talked about them already. Uh, the threat of repetitive flooding has been diminished. It has been diminished. All right, I've been doing OEM 25 years. I was with the police as a special officer for 43. And I remember when I first started with them. We flooded often in the south end, but it was what I call a minor flood. We might have had water in the streets or in the front yards, but it never got to the threshold of your home. Never got into the home. It might have flooded the basement, but it never got into that first floor. We had a lot of those repetitive events. But then as building continued to happen, okay, as restrictions fell into the river, be they trees or anything else, things began to back up, and that's when we started to see the bigger events. So fortunately, that threat of repetitive flooding has been diminished. We'll continue to be through our good efforts of uh, you know continually monitoring and doing debris removal and and um, desnagging and so forth. So that's all good from an emergency management perspective. It's all good stuff. And again, I, I talked about the last one there. Rainfall we already talked about. Drones we've talked about. Block captains we have a few. And the purpose of the block captain is to notify people in their neighborhood in the event there's a phone outage or something like that. We would go to a block captain's house and say, Bill, can you do me a favor? Notify the 10 people on your list or your neighborhood. And that would happen. So if you want to be a block captain, just let us know. Drop us a note. We'll put you on a list and we'll take care of your neighborhood. It's kind of a neighborhood block captain. Same thing with the crime watch. Same type of thing. Thirteen, we beat up. I said that in a nice way. All right, so we're going to move right through them. They can either be called by a phone chain. We have that in a database in our phone system. We can call them all at once. We can do the same thing, by the way, for the senior center. For the senior housing on Hunter Place. We have every phone. There's 100 people that live in that building. There's 100 apartments. We have a little phone block. So if we had to put a message out to that entire building right now, we can do that just to that building. So, um, that's all to our advantage, and it's all good stuff. All right, you can check that out. It's all over the, uh, the internet, search team. You can Google them. It's a nationwide program, very effective. We got a trailer, we got equipment from the state, so we're uh, we're doing quite well. Here's some of the mutual aid resources we use: sheriff's department, area county fire departments. They come in and pumped a lot of basements. We have a task force of fire departments come in after high rain. Uh, the State County EMS mobilization, UASI, stands for Urban Area Search Initiative. It's the five counties in North Jersey that would be impacted by catastrophic land, for example, New York City. Okay. They're called the UASI, the UASI region. So uh, we're part of that as the state county, obviously. And then the private contractors, utility companies. You know, everybody knocks, uh, you know, the power companies, but I just got to say this in, in their defense. And I was just out the other night when we had that power outage. I, I literally get my car and go out and visit the site to see what, what went down, what caused it. These guys, the most of the guys, I've seen a woman or two in the ranks too, but they're dealing with 60,000 volts of equipment. Of, of, Electricity in the dark. In the dark. That was spotlight. So I defy any one of us to want to go out okay, after midnight and go in the woods because all those lines run through Riverdale through the, through the wooded areas. And go find a line or something around at 64,000 volts. Right, and before they can do any work in our neighborhoods, they have to shut that off, they have to coordinate that off, isolate it, divert it, pull the fuse, whatever they got to do to make it safe before the, they will go in and then um, operate. If the winds are over 50 miles an hour, they don't go up in those buckets. Right? They will not go up in the buckets if the wind's over 50 miles an hour. So they got a number of things they got to comply with too, you know, to keep themselves safe. And they have families they have to go, go home to. So if it takes a little bit longer than you thought, just remember the guys and girls that are out there doing this job. They've got to be extremely safe with what they do with these. 
Um, it's really probably one of the most dangerous things out there that occurs during an event like this. So uh, they got to be, you know, strategic. You know, they got to do it in a, you know, in a, in a line, like one, two, three, four, five. They just can't go to the, the final source and say, not the final source, but the final product and say, well, how do I get this working? They got to go right back and trace that network right from the beginning where it starts to be safe. And I know that disturbs a lot of our residents, but it's it's got to be done. Sirens, this is on our calendar. Your borough calendar has this on there. <coughs> we use this if we have to. We'd rather have the voice. We'd rather have the door knocks because people do get confused with this. So people hear it quite well. Mary Beth is in here. She hears it quite well. And it gets her dog going. The dog likes to help. And um, other people can't hear it so much. So we want to make sure. But we're required by the way to have it. We do have it. We use it. And those are the signals right there. All right, well before evacuating, do all of the stuff that you need to do. Secure your loose objects. Bring everything inside. Make sure you have good batteries. Fill your vehicle gas tanks. Remember when the gas, the power went out in Sandy, people were online and gas stations had no power in, so they couldn't fuel vehicles. A lot of them have generators now, but they didn't at the time. Move your vehicles to higher ground. Okay, it just blows my mind to see how many people leave their cars where they are and then they're flooded. And once they're flooded, they're never the same. So, move your vehicles to higher ground. Well in advance of the storm, relocate your pets. And of course, any important items or papers, get them to a higher level. Bring them to a relative's house. Put them in a safe deposit box. Don't leave them in your basement. Don't leave them in your basement. Not good. And again, keep tuned into the local channels. Store three days worth of drinking water. Okay, three days worth at least. You should have water in jugs. You can do that. You don't have to buy it. You can put it in clean jugs. And know the difference between drinking water and water that you're going to use to bathe in or wash dishes in. All right, it doesn't need to be sterile. Only the water you're drinking, you know, needs to be contaminant free because we don't want you to get sick. But um, that's always an issue. Make sure you have meals ready to eat, MREs. I buy a lot of canned goods that don't go bad. You can open them, heat them up. If you have uh, even a barbecue grill, you can heat stuff like that. Don't buy anything perishable. <coughs> Notify relatives and borough OEM of where you'll be going. Let's say you're going to leave town completely. You go to a relative's house in South Jersey. Let us know here. So if we go to your house and there's nobody there, we at least know. So a lot of people stop by here. We have a list. We put them on a list and we get the number of where they're going in case something happens. It's always good to do. And the do's and don'ts are on the calendar and on the website as well. So you may want to look through them. Once the flood disaster is declared, evacuate immediately. If you will wisely choose to stay home, stay indoors. But I don't recommend that you stay home. We've had houses blow up. Right? Two houses blow up after, over the years due to gas main breaks. Not a safe place to be in a house that's flooding. Okay, make sure you let the basement fill with water. You're not going to keep the water out. You're going to collapse the basement. You try to keep the water out. You've heard this before, I'm sure. Make sure your kids are accounted for. Make sure they're not out playing, riding through bikes in the water. Uh, they could get injured. There could be a live wire down. They could get electrocuted. Not a good place to be. It's not a playground uh, once the floodwaters are down there. Keep them away. Keep them under wraps. Shelter stuff we talked about. The biggest thing we always get, again, medication, special dietary food. We don't have a lot of special food there for people. So if you need special food, try to bring it on your own. When evacuating, shut off everything. Unless you have a sump pump, you may want to leave that breaker on to run that sump pump if it'll keep up with it. If you don't think it's going to keep up with it, shut it off. Okay, shut it off. You're just wasting your time and you're creating an electrical hazard, to be quite frank. Uh, secure your doors, open the basement windows, and again, remove cars in advance of flooding. Never drive or walk through uh, flooded roadways. You can. Go to YouTube. Go to YouTube and just query all of the different flooded roadway scenarios, and you'll see idiots driving through flooded roads and the car just starts going. 
sideways. Or nose first, even worse, nose first. And then it flips over. Then the divers got to go in, or the rescue guys got to go in and get these people out of cars. Very dangerous situation. So never drive a walk through. Don't go around through barricades. They're there for a reason. Might have a missing manhole cover. Sometimes they float right off the hole. So if you're walking down the street, you can go right into that manhole. Very dangerous. Always carry ID so we know who you are, and we'll let you back into your neighborhood if it's safe to do so. If you don't have ID, we're not going to let people in. After the flood, we'll notify the shelter people when it's safe. Cleanup kits are always distributed by uh, Red Cross. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to get here because uh, that one storm went right up the eastern seaboard. And there's a lot of information. Be, FEMA will be here. There's a lot of information going out. Just remember to disinfect everything and never mix bleach and ammonia. And it'll take you down. And then disaster assistance center by, by our emergency management plan, it's the Lennox School of Purpose Room. Right, that's the disaster assistance center for insurance companies in FEMA. That's designated. I know in different events, they actually went door to door in the south end, which was good. So we'll let you know where that's going to be. As far as cresting in the rivers, 12 hours after the end of the rainfall. So don't think that's where your river's going to be, because 12 hours later, it's going to be much higher depending on the amount of rain that we got. And sometimes it's a foot to a foot and a half after the event that that river will rise. So be aware of that. We can't pump basements if the water table is high because it's just going to come through the walls and refill the basement. We've got to wait till the water table is below the basement floor of your home and then we can pump the basement out. So we'll put you on a list at the fire department and uh, be patient with the process. Just don't go into the basement with boots on because if there's an electrical short, you're going to be in that water and you can be killed. So stay out of the basement completely. Uh, just wait till it recedes or the water is pumped out. And then it will make it safe to go in there. Remember, homeowner's insurance does not cover flood damage. I think most people know that by now. That's completely separate. And don't wait too late to, to purchase flood insurance because it does take time. To go into effect. And you can Google this other stuff, National Flood Insurance. First Thursday of the month, Flood Advisory Board. If you have any questions related to flood maps or flooding or mitigation efforts that you're doing, please come. I didn't want to lengthen this because we usually run about an hour and it's, it's pretty much on the mark. So if you have questions for tonight, write them down. Don't forget them. See Lauren and, and her. Uh, teammates at the uh, Flood Advisory Board meeting. And uh, you can even mail, email them to Flood Advisory at FontainLakes-NJ.gov. Flood Advisory. And you can email them and, and ensure that you get back to you with any questions you may have. Personal concerns. Some people don't want to bring them up in public. You can email them there privately and they'll get back to you on that. And that board makes recommendations to our town council on what to do regarding mitigation efforts. And uh, they've done an exceptional job. We do believe we relieve flooding, correct? I think everybody that's on that board has seen uh, the fruits of, of your labor, and that's a great thing. Uh, the public may not have, because when you have nothing to compare it to, it doesn't look like anything happens. Like, if my lawn is so high and my neighbors are so high, my lawn isn't that high. <laughs> if my neighbors are short, if mine is high, and mine is high. And I have to cut it. So it's that kind of comparison. Right? Inspecting utilities, I can't say this enough. If you smell gas, call 911. Because when we call the gas company and tell them what I'm seeing is a fire department, they come a little bit faster. Okay? If you call them, they're going to stack those calls. We talked about that earlier. And then they're going to take them in an order, priority order of when you call. Uh, if you smell gas, Remember, depending on the explosive level that you're going through, flammable level, you can have a big problem on your hands. So call us right away. We'll get down here. We'll mitigate the incident. Most of our serve members have a tool to shut the gas off. They know how to do it. I recommend going on the outside of the house if the gas meters in the basement don't go in. Okay? And electrical system damage. If you see sparks or breakers keep tripping, call us. Don't keep resetting breakers. Breakers protect equipment, GFIs protect people. Remember that. 
Good. The GFIs you have in your bathroom, in your kitchen, little buttons that I like to push. It's a lot of work. That's a GFI that protects heat pulling. The breakers that are in your electrical box, they protect the equipment. So you can get electrocuted, but even if the breaker pops and you reset it, you have a problem. Right? GFIs are very, very sensitive. Very sensitive. Millivolts compared to voltage. All right, bubbles always indicate leaks. So if you see bubbles coming up through the water in your basement, we got a leak. It could be sewer leak, it could be gas, natural gas. So be careful with that and uh, give us a call right away. All right, so here we are. We're wrapping up. Be prepared. The best protection for you and your family is prepared in advance. Sit down with your kids and just discuss what they would do. And make it simple. If phones didn't work right now, you want to grab your cell phone and you've got nothing. Where are your kids? Number one. Number two. They're going to try to call you, and nobody's going to get anywhere. Do they know what to do? Do they have a neighbor, adult neighbor, they can go to? Do they have a relative they can go to that may live in proximity? Do you have a meeting point for families on your on your block? I know a lot of you with friends in your own neighborhoods. Do you have a you know meeting of minds, place where meeting of minds can go? So at least you have comfort in the numbers. You know what I mean? Rather than being in the house alone. Is that all that creepy stuff? So it's, so it's happening? I don't even like being home alone. <laughs> <laughs> so prepare and plan and tell them what to do. Because like I said, school's got to cover. School's got more emergency plans than you can imagine. So when you're in school, you know, you're pretty much safe to go. It's when they're out and about in the neighborhood on the bikes, walking the dog, whatever the case may be, what do they do? when something happens. All right, that's the type of stuff you want to go over. Review those booklets. Take some magnets home, uh, please. And uh, be safe. The bottom line is be safe. Thank you. My famous saying, Ben Franklin, right? If you fail to plan, plan to fail. So make sure you have plans. And make sure everybody knows the plans. Make sure they do the plans. Just to give an example. Kids practicing fire escape from their house. When we had fire prevention open house, I said to the couple of parents that were there, all right, you have a plan, you drew it on paper, did you practice it? What do you mean? Did you make the kids do it? Because if you didn't make them do it, it's like a football team practicing plays and they were going out on the field and, and trying to execute them. And then we have a few football players here, a few football fans. Some Eagles fans, too. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But... <laughs> Execute the plan. Make sure they can do it. If you have a ladder that drops out your second story window, make sure they climb down that ladder. Not when, God forbid, it's a serious incident, but when they can do it with a little bit of confidence. Okay? Very, very important. Storm ready. I'm just going to scroll through this. We, we beat this up. Uh, we're very fortunate to be storm ready. If you're interested in seeing who is, just Google storm ready, and it'll show you the municipalities in New Jersey that are, and there's, there's not very many of them. World, world, uh, world Disney World is. So you're safe down there. <laughs> <laughs> all right? And uh, and that's about it. This is all the stuff we had to go through to get storm ready. Spotters. How many spotters in the room? Raise your hand. Great. You want to be a storm, uh, storm spotter? These are people that are trained to see different weather events, cloud formations, and they call it in to the National Weather Service. For example, last week's storm, what night was that? Friday. We had hail, right? There were towns that had quarter-sized hail, some even golf-sized hail. And that's what they want it reported as, using coins or golf ball as the, uh, as the medium rather than measurement, because who could measure it, right? Um, when you see hail, you really can't measure, but you can say it looks like about the size of a golf ball. We had a lot of hail, which is indicative of a thunderstorm. There's always hail produced in a thunderstorm. So we had some significant, I didn't see any here in Pompton, where I was, but that's not saying it didn't fall here. But uh, they call that into up to New York, and then they can uh, help them identify different weather patterns, especially with tornadoes and things like that, versus a downdraft. They get some good qualified information from people on the ground. 
Boots on the ground is what it is. That's what those people are. And they're trained. Okay? You know about National Flood Insurance Program? You can Google that. Go to that. Community rating system. We are a five again. We just got notified. Okay, by the government. And we are a National uh, Flood Insurance Program, right? That we are maintain our classification as a five. Again, a lot of hard work by a lot of different people. And uh, Liz included is the coordinator. And um, we just got to keep working so we can get to a four. Because on a scale of one to ten, that's how it's, it's rated. And that gives people reductions on their insurance. Uh, on their insurance premiums. 25%. Up right? to 25%. Up to 25%. So uh, we're in good shape that way. And thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, go home, tell your neighbors about this. You know, try to get in a discussion. Maybe next year we can get a little bigger crowd and get more people educated out of themselves. Thank you very much. the storm, or I'll see it on Facebook on emergency management, and they want their asking us to predict the weather. <laughs> we will never, Director Evangelista and representatives from emergency management will never predict the weather. And we understand that you're home, it may be your power is that you're not really sure what's going on, or your TV is not up, or you're just nervous about the situation, and you ask us, well, how much more rain are we getting, or how much more of this way, how high is it coming? We will never, we will never predict the weather. It's not that we're not giving you an answer, but we just will never will. We will always refer you to NOAA um, and to the websites to check out the rivers and to look on the weather forecasts from NOAA. Um, it's not that we're, we don't want to address your problems. It's just that that's something that we just will never do. Yeah. And we've seen very often different rainfalls within a very small limited area, you know, around our community. So. Depending where that cloud stalls or if the storm moves, you know, we can have much more rain than you know, neighbor. Um, we, as a community, have hired part time a new social media person who's working closely with Liz and other people. Yes. Is there any um, coordination between you and that social media well, person? Well, I do want to meet the young man, but he okay. has picked up on my posts okay. and he's reposting it on that. For our website, which is nice. Yeah, we want to get that. you together. Yeah, so we'll do that and we'll use that as another meeting. Okay, Thank you. Great. Any other suggestions? Or, you know, anything you might want to discuss along the lines of emergency management? Uh, first of all, thank you for the information. You're welcome. So there's people in this room, they've stated before, but the people watching at home is really what we're talking about. But I think the key element of it, look, we're always going to have issues after a storm. Give us some time to get things done before you start making phone calls and making demands and what has to be done. We, we have to work through a process. It takes some time to get our DPW and OEM and our police in, in, in line to do what they have to do. So just give them a little time, bunker down, hold out, and then we'll get to you. Very good point. What the age of media now, everybody thinks it has to be done in this second. Sure. Okay. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.